Okay, so is it running? Yeah, it's running. Okay, pituitary gland. The pituitary gland lies inferior to what structure in the brain? The, the hypothalamus. Maybe we'll do a little review and we'll get into it more. So hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is above it. There is a connection piece, and I'll show you the picture if you guys are looking for this here. What's the connection between the hypothalamus and the pituitary? It's a little tough pronunciation. Infundibulum. Infundibulum. It connects the pituitary and... Did I ask you how many portions of the pituitary last time? There's two. The front would be what? Yeah, we did this. Anterior and the back would be posterior pituitary. Which one of those when we go from the hypothalamus down to it, do we go on a nerve? Towards the posterior or towards the anterior? The posterior involves a nervous connection. So how do we go from the hypothalamus to the anterior if it's not nerves? Through the bloodstream. And what I mean, how do we go there is how do we get hormones down to that area? So where's this picture here? There's a picture you know, somewhere around here, this one. It's uh, after the one I was just on. It's probably like six, seven slides into the pituitary. So if you want to print this one out large, I guess you can as well. So hypothalamus, in the green we have nerves. It's going down to the posterior pituitary. And then you see the blood vessels going down to the anterior pituitary. Which one of those has more hormones in it, the anterior or the posterior pituitary? Go back, 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 back. There we go. Anterior pituitary. Anterior pituitary, how many hormones do you see in there? One, two, three, four, five, six hormones. There is actually a um, seventh one, but sometimes they consider it part of the intermediate lobe, and that's MSH. I'm not going to test you on it, but I think there's a diagram somewhere. I don't know. I know I'm jumping back and forth. Uh, here it says MSH. It's melanocyte stimulating hormone. Melanocytes, they make melanin. Melanin, what is that for? It's big skin pigmentation. So sometimes the intermediate lobe is considered part of the anterior, sometimes they consider it different. I'm just not going to worry about that right now. So, okay, so just, I'm jumping around, but I'm trying to stay within these six, seven slides. Pituitary gland, another name for the pituitary gland is the what? Sounds like an educated guess. Yeah, a hypothesis. The hypothesis is another name of it. It sits in the cella tercica. That's the Turkish saddle that's in the sphenoid bone. And then here you go. Here's the infundibulum. That's the connection piece that I asked you guys earlier. So that, that's the slide right after the intro. Again, this is the one showing you the hormones. Oxytocin, vasopressin. Don't confuse the A's. ACTH, I know I didn't get into it last time, just maybe briefly, I'm gonna get to it more today. This one, the A is standing for what gland? The adrenal gland. The adrenal gland is located on top of what organs? The top of the kidneys. ADH will go to the kidneys. What's ADH stand for? Good, anti-diuretic hormone. So will it increase or decrease urination? Anti-diuretic, a diuretic, it's like caffeine, alcohol, diuretics increase urination, so anti-diuretic will decrease urination. So it's gonna do the opposite effect of blood pressure because if you're decreasing urination, you're keeping more fluid in your blood vessels. So what are you gonna to do to blood pressure? You're gonna increase blood pressure. So th those are medications that are used in terms of regulating uh, blood pressure. And here the more is vasopressin, or pressins just for short. Yeah, so you can cross this one off here. It starts off, it says median eminence up top. You just cross that slide off. And then let's make sure the slide after that. This is your connection to the anterior pituitary, it's the blood vessels. Again, what's the connection to the posterior pituitary? It would be nerves. And this is where we left off last time. Is two, three more slides after that. Releasing hormones and inhibiting hormones. The part that I want to focus on here are the releasing hormones, RH. 
This is something I'm going to repeat quite a few times today, so you, you should have it down. So the hypothalamus is going to secrete what we call releasing hormones. There's going to be different classes. So what I'm going to do here, just a little brief outline, is I'm going to go through this part, make sure you highlight some things. I'm going to draw uh, quite a few things right after that. The anterior pituitary is also known as the adeno, how do we say that? Hypothesis, good, the adeno hypothesis, coming from anterior. So wh why is this important? It's the same idea as when you saw in your last exam, acidophilia and eosinophilia. You understood what eosinophil was, but you didn't know like acidophil as much. But acidophil is the same as eosinophil. Anterior pituitary is the same as adenohypothesis. So just two different names meaning the same thing. Again, just you probably got it, but if you're looking at your multiple choice, you don't see anterior pituitary, then another one you look for is adenohypothesis. So you said nerves connect to the posterior pituitary. What's the word for a nerve cell? A neuron. So the posterior, if we jump a couple slides after these pictures here, right, like four or five slides, it's also called the neural hypothesis because there's a nerve connection going from the hypothalamus down to the posterior pituitary. There's a bunch of extra things down here, such as telling you the hormones that are coming out of here and telling you that it's going to manufacture these hormones. That's a point I'm going to come back to later. But for right now, I just want to give you the other names for it. So the posterior pituitary is the neural hypothesis. And what's the other name for the anterior pituitary? Good. Adeno hypothesis. So make sure you have both those names down. Okay. Now, I think we're going to start doing some drawings here. I'm just looking here in a second. All right. So you got a piece of paper that has two pictures, one on each side. One of them is just this one, much larger. And the idea that I want to go through here is, I was telling you last time, I'm going to do levels, like level one, level two, level three. That's an idea that's going to repeat. For example, level one is going to be the higher region <coughs> up here in the brain. What's that region where we start? Hypothalamus. Level two is going to be the gland right beneath that. Which one is that? Pituitary. So that's going to be level two. I'm going to write this out in a moment. And then level three, we're going to call our what organs? We're aiming for them. So our target organs, which are all of these, depending on which one we're trying to aim for. An organ is a target organ if on its cell surface or inside its cell, it has a what for the hormone? It has a receptor for it. So we'll be doing level one, level two, level three. The one that we're going to start off with is the one that has a T in it. The T is going to be talking about what gland that's in the neck. Thyroid gland. So we're going to talk about the hormones going down through here. Now there's a bunch of different images and things that kind of describe this on here. And if I go back, you will see this chart, which is right after the adeno hypothesis. It's like probably five slides back from where those slides are at. Again, if you're not, if you're wondering why we're all over the place here, it's because these are the publishers' powerpoints, and I'm trying to get you guys to learn how to go through these here, like like a textbook, and get what you need out of them. So, this is another way to show the levels: Rh, releasing hormones. Those are going to be coming out of what area? That level one, what's level one? Hypothalamus. So releasing hormones are going to be coming out of the hypothalamus. That's all of these right here. And they're showing you it's coming down from the hypothalamus. Level two will be our pituitary gland. You'll see these over here. SH, I didn't say it. Maybe you might know what the S is for. Does anybody know? Yeah, stimulating. Good. Stimulating hormone. So we'll talk about that as well. And then level three is going to be our target organs. And then we'll have hormones coming out of that. So let's take a moment here and draw this idea. You got a piece of paper? That's a good idea. So I'm going to do this once, and then we'll repeat it again. Okay, so level one, or the uppermost level, in terms of what we're talking about here, is what area in the brain? Good. 
hypo thalamus. Level two is going to be what next underneath that? Pituitary, good. The pituitary has what and what portions to it? Yeah. Anterior and posterior. Which one of those has the majority of the hormones? Yeah, the anterior has the majority. And then level three is going to be our what? Good. It's going to be our target organ. Okay, so let's do an example here. If we go up to level one, and we're going to talk about this gland in the neck. What's the main gland in the neck here? That's a thyroid gland, right? By the, underneath the thyroid cartilage. We're going to have a hormone, and it's called CRH. What did I say the RH is for? Releasing hormone. The C is cortical tropin. Cortical tropin releasing hormone. What region is cortical referring to? What region of the adrenal gland? The cortex of it. So it's going to go to the cortex, or it's going to help stimulate the cortex of it. This one's not going right to it, but it's going to help stimulate the hormones coming from it indirectly. You'll see how in a moment. But when we talk about organs, there's an outer area called the cortex, and then there's an inner area we call that the what? The medulla. So it's corticotropin because we're going to talk about the hormones coming from the cortex of it. All right, now uh, I totally messed this up on you guys, by the way. I meant to put a T. So I jumped to adrenal glands. I'm really trying to jump ahead right now and finish this. So let's uh, change that there. And thyro. You guys can forgive me for that? Yeah. I was just trying to get done. Okay, TRH. I was talking about thyroid, and then you start hearing about adrenal gland, you're probably like, what? Okay, so TRH, thyrotropin, releasing hormone. So TRH is going to go down to the pituitary gland, and it's going to stimulate TSH. T here is now just thyroid. As you see up here, it was thyrotropin. Over here, it, the T is just thyroid. And it's thyroid, what's the S again? Good, and if you want, write these down. I'm just not writing it here. Stimulating and the H hormone. Since these things have H at the end, what class of hormones are they? They are peptides. So thyroid stimulating hormone, another thing to say about it, which branch is it coming from of the pituitary? What division? Yeah, it's coming from the anterior. The acronym for the anterior, F-L-A-T. P, little i, G. The F, let's see if you guys can name these. What's the F? Yep. Well, you don't have to name them. How about give the rest of the abbreviation? So F is follicle, but F what? FSH, this L is LH, this A is. Is it ADH or ACTH? Good, ACTH. The T here, which is this right here. The P and I are together. What's that? Prolactin and the G. GH or growth hormone. Okay, so we'll, we'll make sure we name all of these later on. But let's do TSH here. So TSH is coming from, again, which division of the pituitary? Anterior. So how, how is TRH getting to it? Is it going through the blood or through a nerve to get down to that? If it's in the anterior. It's going to go down through the blood through that portal system, the portal vessels. Portal vessels. And then TSH is going to go through the bloodstream and it's going to go to what target organ? Yeah, it's going to go to the thyroid gland. So in this case here, we'd have thyroid gland, or just thyroid. And the hormones that are going to come out of here are T3 and T4, which we're going to talk about. So again, this idea is going to repeat. You have TRH, which is thyrotropin. What's the RH? Releasing hormone. That's going to go down to make thyroid what? 
the stimulating hormone to get it to release, and then finally to the thyroid to release T3 and T4. So what, what's the whole idea with this? Why does it go like that? Well, we need to control these glands in our body. And the glands don't have their own brains. Our brain is up here. So we need a way to get down from the brain down to the gland, wherever that gland is going to be. So you start up, up top and you have your releasing hormones. Those are like the main ones. i just making an analogy here. I'll say like they're the president. Now the president's got to give a message to the workers down at the end to get them to start doing uh, their work. But the president, you know, send a message down to the vice president here, which will be the TSH, and then that will go through the bloodstream and get to the target organ and the workers. In this case, the thyroid gland will do its work in terms of secreting its hormone. So it's just the messaging system that's going on down throughout that body. So there's just three different levels to go down through. Now, uh, what was I going to throw in here? Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint here for a moment. So you can kind of see this idea repeated throughout here. <clears throat> you have RH, releasing hormone, and then that's going to be going down here. It's saying hormone one. But what's supposed to be hormone one? If, if this is TRH, what's hormone one that's coming out of here? Yeah, TSH, and then the endocrine organ, if this is the thyroid gland, what's hormone two coming out of the thyroid gland? Yeah, T3 and T4. That's not written up there, but we wrote them down, down here. So releasing hormones are from the hypothalamus. Stimulating hormones are from the what? Below the hypothalamus? Pituitary. So just the way I try not to confuse them is I think like if you have, I don't know, it's kind of random to stop. If you have like three balls in space and if you release the first one, then it's going to stimulate the second one and then go down to the third. So I think of the first is like you release something, so it's a releasing hormone. That's from up top, then you stimulate down below, etc. It's just a way to kind of think about it. And the idea, as you see, repeats depending on where you're going to the liver, uh, to the adrenal glands, etc., going down through there. So what I want to do is take this idea and go all the way back to, I'm not sure, is it page 8 or something? We want to go to the thyroid gland. It says thyroid and parathyroid. It's 10. All right, page 10. So now we're going to get into the details of what's going down here at the thyroid gland. So the thyroid gland is just telling you there's two lobes, whatever. I'm not going to test you on this anatomy part right here. There is one thing, though, that I am going to mention, and that's this right here, cuboidal epithelium. I'm going to talk about that in this picture we're going to look at here. Okay, so just right now, just uh, highlight this stuff. And again, I'm going to draw. Or actually, I'm going to go to a picture, not draw. Right, there's thyroglobulin. Thyroglobulin includes both T3 and T4. Thyroxine is another name for T4. But if you look in the blue here, that's something that means 4. Tetra. So what means 3 down here? Let's try. But 3 or 4 of what element? Of iodide. 3 or 4 of iodide. So this, what we're going to look at is we're going to understand where all these things are hopefully coming from here. So again, just get these definitions down for right now, make sure you know where they are. Okay, so we're going to look inside the thyroid gland, and we're going to look at the other picture on the other side of the page that I handed you in a moment. So if we look at the thyroid gland, it's in the neck, and it has this bubbly appearance to it. And that's kind of an idea we want to take or keep in mind. It has a bubbly appearance to it. So what I like to describe it is as little water balloons. Like here's a water balloon, here's one, here's one. It's a bunch of little water balloons packaged together. So when you slice it and you look at it, here's the inside of the water balloons. The water balloons are called follicles, just like hair follicles. So the, the fluid part here, which would be like the water inside the water balloon, is here, here, here. So it's like you see five balloons that were cut. And then this is what it looks like here in uh, living tissue. Or like what used to be living tissue. So the thyroglobin will be there. And this is the picture that we're going to focus on. So I'm just trying to get uh, gauge us where we are in the body. 
So we're going to look inside one follicle. What type of epithelium does that follicle have when around it? It's simple cuboidal epithelium. And simple means how many layers? As one layer. Good. So this is the inside. So we're taking a little piece of the inside. That's what this box is showing. A little part right in here to be the yellow. And then what are these uh, red structures symbolized? And they symbolize capillaries, the smallest vessel structures, because that's going to be our connection to release hormones into the blood and to bring uh, certain substances into it. So we're zooming in on it. Here's a capillary, here's a simple cuboidal cell, and here's the inside of it. As you see, there's pretty much like a cycle that's going on around here. So this is why I want to emphasize it's really good for you guys to be here today because these steps that we're going to go through are not written in your packet. And I'm definitely going to be questioning you on what's going through. Maybe some of you can understand them on your own, but I just want to make sure that we uh, understand them together. So if you look at the capillary, what element is important to consume in your diet in order to make thyroid hormones? Iodine. Iodine, just depending on whether it has a charge or not. If it doesn't have a charge, it's iodine. If it does, it's iodine. So iodide ions, it's important. You get that from salt in your diet. If you don't eat iodine or you don't have a good salt nutrition or the soil is not um, well salted because it's not on the coast and maybe you live inland more in different countries, you end up with this big structure here. What is that called? Some of you might know it. What is it you said, I think? Yeah, a goiter. For those who don't know what a goiter is, well, I hope you didn't just eat. But What's that? From a goiter? Yeah. Was she hyper or hypo? Mm. Yeah, it can get really bad. Like you guys can see here, here's some images. Uh, you can see it can get a lot worse right there. That's the thyroid gland. And it can get, get really, really bad. Like you see uh, right here in this picture. Yeah, so that's, that's why you should eat your salts, but not a lot of salt, or you're going to get hypertension. So usually where this happens is out in um, countries that are not on the coast. If, why, why countries that are not on the coast? What are coast countries? Yeah, the sea salt gets into the soil, so their, their products will have that good salt inside there, the iodine. So usually it's more inland countries that are like third world countries that see a lot of that. And if you look up, um, there's maps that will highlight where those are happening. But anyways, uh, so you need iodide here in your diet. But iodide can't go in by itself. If you're looking, and I want you guys to start to interpret this picture, what do you need in order to get iodide into this cell? What hormone? Right there. TSH. So these are things like maybe you can start writing these you know, steps. I don't necessarily have step one, step two. But I'm just kind of putting things together. So you need iodide to make thyroid hormones. And in order to get in, you need what hormone to be present there? You need TSH in order to get into it. Where's TSH coming from? Yeah, the pituitary. Which division of the pituitary gland? Anterior pituitary. What's another name for the anterior pituitary gland? Deno hypothesis. So you see, you want to keep doing these bridges. You don't want to use the word that you know. Okay, anterior pituitary. In the back of your mind, like, I know there's another name, so just practice saying it even though it's kind of tough. So adeno hypothesis. So it's coming from that uh, division. What, what's causing the release of TSH from above it? TRH. TRH is thyrotropin, what? Releasing hormone, good. So TRH will be released, which will cause the release of TSH. And TSH is going to come down here and help pump iodide into the cell. And just one more time, what shape is this cell? It's a cuboidal cell. So anytime you see a cell that's large, cuboidal, or what's the taller one? Yeah, the columnar or columnar. It means it has things it's going to be secreting or absorbing. We're going to see it when we get to the digestive system. So it's coming inside here, 
And I want you guys to follow the arrows on your own here and tell me what amino acid is iodide going to combine with? What amino acid is iodine combined with? Here. Here. Tyrosine. Okay. So this is why we're doing this. I want to make sure you guys get this step. So it's going to combine with tyrosine. But now if you stop and think and we want to bridge what we've done before, we have how many different groups of hormones? How many different categories? We have three categories. We have our amines, which are what derivatives? Amino acid derivatives. There were two amino acids. There was tryptophan, and there was what? And there was tyrosine. Tyrosine made the majority of them. Tyrosine made T4, T4 being thyroxine, the one that's on your list. So now we're looking at the production of it. So iodine's coming here. And again, how does iodine get in? With what? TSH. And look, what else is, what else is iodine and tyrosine going to combine with? What else is iodine and tyrosine combining with before it goes into the follicle cavity? Iodide, we have tyrosine, and thyroglobulin. They're all going to combine here. The peroxidase is just an enzyme that's going to pump them here inside into the cell and start to combine them as well. So. We have iodide and tyrosine and some thyroglobulin. You highlighted what thyroglobulin was, but it's also up there. Thyroglobulin, is it T3, is it T4, or is it both of them together? Both of them together. If I just go back, like those three slides where you highlighted the words, you'll see thyroglobulin stored in the follicle cells. It's composed of T3 and T4. Which one, T3 or T4, which one is triiodothyronine? Three. Alright, we're starting off easy. Which one? Well, you tell me. What's it going to be? Not tri, but it's going to be what? Tetra. Finish it off. Tetra. Yeah, it's the first time you're doing it. Iodo. Thyronine. Tetra. Iodo. Thyronine. And then the other one would be? Thyronine. Okay, but which one of those is thyroxine? T3 or T4? Do I remember if you see the X in thyroxine, the X has four points to it at each end. So that's just a little way to remember it. So thyroxine is T4. Right, so we have in here triiodothyronine and thyroxine. They're combining, making thyroglobulin because it's a glob. It's just a whole big thing. Like hemoglobin, it's a big component. It's not a string, it's not fibrous like collagen. It's a big glob of a bunch of them. So what happens is you have tyrosine. Tyrosine uh, are these little molecules that you see inside here. And T3 and T4 are referring to the number of what on the tyrosine? The number of iodides on the tyrosine. So if we go back here, you see triiodo has three iodides. Thyroxine T4 has four iodides on it. So they didn't draw on there. It would have been nice, but you would see uh, if it was T3, you'd see how many lines coming off of here with eyes on it. You'd see three. Down here, if it was T4, you'd see four iodides coming off of it. Just a little chemistry if you want to know where it's coming from. So depending on how many iodides, for example, what you see exactly here in this picture, is this going to make T3 or T4 from what you're looking at here? T3, because you see three iodides and they're going to combine with the tyrosine. Okay, so let's just review these steps here. You have them. Uh, definitely it's good to write them down if you don't. Okay, so iodide is important to co consume in our diet. If we don't have iodide, you can end up with a what? End up with a gourd. So iodide's going to go in, but it's not going to go in by itself. What hormone is going to help to get it in there? TSH, because the TSH sensitive pump. TSH needs to bind. It's the key to the door to let the iodide into it. Once it goes in, it's going to combine with how many other compounds in there? Two. And then combine with two more. Which one of those? Thyroglobulin or tyrosine? Which one of those is the amino acid? Tyrosine. Okay, so it's going to combine with tyrosine, it's going to combine with thyroglobulin. Thyroglobulin is composed of what? T3 and T4. Which one of those is thyroxine? 
T4. Then it gets pumped in by the enzyme and combined all together by this peroxidase. You know it's an enzyme because what do you see on there? You see the ACE on there. And then you make thyroglobulin. Any questions up to this point before we go down? Okay, so now, well, what's the whole purpose of doing this? Well, we're not always eating the iodine or the iodide. We're not consistently consuming it. So why, why would we leave it in here? What's the whole idea? Save it for later. It's, it's storage. So when it's time to be needed, we're going to break it down. So endocytosis, meaning in or out endo. And we're going into that cell, the cuboidal cell. And it's fusing with what organelle? Lysosome. Lysosomes, lice. What does lice mean? Yeah, pretty much break. Uh, burst, it depends, but break more importantly. So it's going to break up. What is it breaking up if we look at that? T3 and T4, but when we have them combined, it's called what? Thyroglobulin. So we're going to lyse thyroglobulin into its separate components, T3 and T4. Because lysosomes contain digestive enzymes, they contain acids as well too, so they're going to break things down. And then T3 and T4, they're heading into the bloodstream, down where it says number seven. And when they go through the bloodstream, by looking at that diagram, are they going to travel free or bound? They're going to travel bound. How many different uh, proteins there can they bind to? There's three of them. The main one you probably have in mind is albumin. This is a new one right here, transthyretin, just a, another protein in the blood. And T, uh, what do you think the T stands for? Thyroid, what about the B? What's going on? Binding, and then G, it's big and it's round, globulin. Thyroid binding globulin. So there's three different proteins that it can um, connect to. And it's going to travel. When hormones are travel, traveling in the blood bound to the protein, are they going to last longer or shorter in the bloodstream? They last longer because they're protected. If they're not protected, they're free to be broken and digested just by other enzymes in the blood. So if they're bound, it's protected from being digested or from being broken down. So it's going to last longer in the bloodstream. Okay? So again, what's the amino acid that we need in order to make thyroxine? or any of them, the amino acid we need is tyrosine. What's the element that we need? We need iodine. What's the name of T3 and T4 when they're combined together? Thyroglobulin. What organelle do we need in order to break up thyroglobulin? Lysosome. And how many different proteins to travel in the blood with them? Three of them. Good. Any questions with that part? So I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions there. Those are the type that you're going to see. So you want to be familiar with it. If you go home and you forgot like a step or it doesn't make sense, then come back and ask. The, yeah, that these are the binding proteins. So when they travel through the blood, they're going to be bound to these proteins that protect them. Because if they're not protected, they can be broken down, uh, chemically digested, which means they're not going to be effective anymore. So they're going to uh, stay informed until they get to where they have to get to their target uh, cells or glands. Actually, if, let's go back here for a moment and show you guys the video you've already seen before. Go to McGraw Hill, and just type in endocrine. So that first results. When you click on the animations, I showed you guys these quite a few times here last time. Here's thyroxine. So what number are we going to be looking at? T1. We're going to be looking at T4 here. So thyroxine, T4. Which class of hormones does it fall underneath? Which one of the three classes? Right here it means, which means they are what derivatives? Amino acid derivatives. And we just saw a couple times now, which amino acid specifically? Tyrosine. Now, it means amino acids, this was in your quiz last time, they're going to have extra or intracellular receptors. It means the whole group. Both, it depends. This one here is going to have which type? 
you know, have intracellular receptor. That's why we see part of the inside of the cell here. So it's going to be intracellular, so it's what soluble? It'll be it's lipid soluble. The rest of the amines are water soluble, so they're going to have what type of receptors? Extracellular, because the whole idea is they can't make it through the phospholipid bilayer. If a hormone is lipid soluble, it's going to go into every single cell in the body. But how come it doesn't affect every single cell in the body? It needs to have a receptor for it inside that cell. So here we're, we're looking at T4. So uh, how many different names for T4? Two. Two. Tri or tetra? Tetra. And what's the other one? Uh, another name for T4? Thyroxine. So it's showing you here it's bound to a protein carrier, but how many protein carriers did we see? Three. So this finishes. Because it is lipophilic, thyroxine can easily pass through the cell membrane. Thyroxine contains four iodines and is often abbreviated T4, tetraiodothyronine. The thyroid gland also secretes smaller amounts of a similar molecule that has only three iodines. Now I want you to pay attention to which one has the biggest effect once it gets inside the cell. Called triiodothyronine, T3. Both hormones enter target cells, but all the T4 that enters is converted into T3. Thus, only the T3 form of the hormone enters the nucleus and binds to nuclear receptor proteins. The hormone receptor protein complex, in turn, binds to the appropriate hormone response elements on DNA. The binding of the hormone receptor complex has a direct effect on the level of transcription at the site where it binds. The messenger RNA, mRNA, produced then codes for specific proteins. So, as you can see, which one has the effect on the cell? T3. T3. So make sure you jot that down as well, because I don't think that's in the packet. So T3 is the one that's going to have the effect once it gets inside the cell. That next picture is illustrating something we've done just in a different way. So when we, all, we start at level one, where we have our releasing hormones. What part of the brain is that? Hypothalamus. So here we have TRH coming from the hypothalamus. Not just thyroid, but what's the T stand for? Thyroid. Not up here, this one's a different one. Up in the hypothalamus. I didn't ask you guys enough, but yeah, thyrotropin. Thyro I just think like tropics or something. Uh, I forget what it means. I think something like eating or producing, something like that. But thyrotropin releasing hormone. As when you look at it, it's going to the adenohypothesis. So is that the anterior or the posterior? The anterior. What's going to come out of the anterior, the adenohypothesis? TSH, thyroid what? A stimulating hormone. Now, if we step back a second, how did TRH get down to the adenohypothesis? In the bloodstream. So then TSH is going to be released. It's going to go through the bloodstream. It's going to get to the thyroid gland. It's going to release T3 and T4. Just one more time, which one of those um, is thyroxine? T4, so we'll get those to travel through the blood. It can be bound to how many different proteins if they're bound? Like three of them. And if you look back here, it says increase T3 and T4 concentrations in the blood suppress, or in other words, inhibit TRH and TSH. So where's TRH coming from? Hypothalamus. And where's TSH? Pituitary gland. So here's something that's going to lead you into the extra credit for the unit, which hopefully I will post up uh, this weekend here. All right. So if T3 and T4 levels rise or increase, what we were just saying right here before I switched over is we're going to go up here to the hypothalamus. And are we going to increase or decrease the secretion of TRH? We're going to decrease. It says suppress. That's a sign for inhibit. You'll see this uh, nomenclature used over and over. 
So when you see two lines, it means it's going to stop it. It's going to suppress it. And it's also going to go where as well, too. What's the other one here? It's going to go to T, S, H. And again, what does that line mean, those two lines? And suppress or inhibit. So it's going to do what to the concentrations or the amounts of these in the blood? It's going to decrease it. So hopefully this will start to make sense now. Is when this starts to go up, by the way, what type of feedback is this before I tell you? Negative feedback. So as T3 and T4 start to increase, we don't want them to keep going up because metabolism starts to increase. For example, hyperthyroidism would be T3 and T4 keep going and keep going and keep going. Maybe you guys already know this. What would happen to weight? Would it increase or decrease when you increase uh, metabolism? It's going to decrease the weight because you're burning things faster. So uh, T3 and T4 are going to keep going up, but we need to shut them off. So how do we shut them off? We go all the way back to the beginning and anything basically above it. So we're going to inhibit those. So by inhibiting these, we're going to inhibit the release of it. It's just, again, like a series of steps, like dominoes in a line. So when this gets released, it stimulates here, and then it goes down and activates the thyroid uh, gland. How this will tie into uh, extra credit for the unit and how is this important clinically in terms of, like, how do you diagnose a pituitary adenoma versus thyroid cancer or hyperthyroidism? Well, pituitary adenoma, we mean we're in the pituitary gland. Adenoma is simply just what? What's happening to the pituitary gland? It's just it's a word everybody knows in here. Number of cells growing out of control. Cancer. Adenoma is just a cancer in a gland. It's just a special word for it. So if you have a pituitary adenoma, again, adenoma is a cancer in a gland. We're going to have an increase of what? Which one of these hormones? Which one's going to go up right away? If there's a pituitary adenoma. If you have more cells of something, you're producing more of what's in that cell. Yes. Yeah, it's fine. Secreting, stimulating. So thyroid stimulating hormone is going to go up. If thyroid stimulating hormone starts to increase, what is that going to do to T3 and T4 levels? It's going to increase it. What is that going to do to TRH levels? suppress it so it's gonna decrease it so if somebody has a pituitary adenoma and you're taking their blood sample and you're measuring for the different hormones in there which is what you do you'll find a high TS, TSH level and high uh, free T4 because T4 is free and it's bound but free means it's not bound to a protein so now you know what it means when you see free T4 F-R-E-E -E. so you'll see a high level of those hormones but if somebody has let's say hyperthyroidism or thyroid cancer, they're gonna have only one of these in a high amount. Which one is that gonna be? One of these groups. If they have thyroid cancer, then cells are growing, they're secreting a lot. So it's just gonna be in the thyroid gland, so what's gonna be high? The T3 and the T4. Because when these are high, what do they do to these two up here? They suppress or they inhibit them. They bring them down. So the problem with pituitary adenomas, we started here, so it's going to affect everything down below. Here is, okay, these are normal. So this will always be high no matter how low these levels are. So that, that's how you compare them, is you compare the level of TSH versus the level of T3 and T4. So that's an important step in regulation. Yes? Because what's, what's an adenoma? Cancer. Okay. So cancer is just, you can't control it. It just keeps growing. The cell numbers just keep increasing. So even though the TRH is being suppressed, it doesn't matter in your case because it's going no matter what. It has a mind of its own, the cells. The cell cycle can't stop. So it doesn't matter what you do, it's just going to keep growing and growing and secreting. TRH thinks. A body thinks, well, maybe we decrease TRH, we'll decrease TSH, but that doesn't do anything because it has a mind of its own, basically. Okay. It's a good question because it's showing that you're, you're seeing and you're thinking about it there. Is there another question on this here?
Who's Tiro? Tiro Chopin and the RH as well. Releasing hormones. Thyrotropin releasing hormones. All the releasing hormones are coming from the hypothalamus. One more on that. So here's the TSH spelled out for you guys. Next slide, thyroid stimulating hormone. So I, I used to think secreting, I've heard a couple people say that, but I won't trick you with the S. It's not something I care to do. So thyroid stimulating hormone. So what's the importance of the thyroid hormones now, the T3 and the T4? Why are they necessary in the body? What are they doing? Well, pretty much everything. That's pretty much the general answer. It's increasing the development of bones, of muscles, of nerves, of metabolism, of pretty much every part in your body. So it's a very important hormone. That's why if people don't have a thyroid gland, they have to live on medication. Does anybody know the name of medication? Synthroid, right? Synthroid would be, I believe, the generic name, the generic or brand name. The other one, levothyroxine, is another one. It's all the same drug. Uh, levothyroxine would be generic. Synthroid would be the brand name. So, what is that doing? It mimics, well, levothyroxine. It mimics which one then? Thyroxine. T T1, T4. So that's what that drug is doing. If somebody removes their thyroid gland. All right. And one more thing here that I forgot to highlight as well. It's going to help increase the rate of cellular metabolism. That's important. Calorogenic effect, I'm not going to get into that whole thing. That's more chemistry stuff. Now, the parathyroid part, you can cross off. I know it's highlighted, but we talked about this in bones, how it regulates the level of calcium. But the thyroid gland also has... Again, I'm not testing you on this part or extra credit or anything, so you can ignore it. But it has the C cells, and just to show you where they are, now you understand the thyroid a little bit more. We have the follicles, and between each of the water balloons or these follicles, we have a group of cells. They're called C cells because they're clear and they're stained. They don't pick up the acidic or the basic stain. But what's fortunate is they also secrete a hormone that starts with C, which is calcitonin. So, and then the parathyroid hormone, that's right on top of the thyroid. Again, we talked about that in bones, so I'm not going to test you on that. But the parathyroid hormone is coming on the parathyroid glands, which are those four purple ones that you see on there. Again, I'm not testing you on the rest of this part. So you can ignore the calcitonin and all that calcium coming after that. Any questions with that gland there? So now we're going to do adrenal gland. Adrenal gland, here again, don't get thrown off. It's also known as a supra-renal gland. What's renal? Kidneys. Isn't supra meaning what? Above it. So it's above the kidneys. And it's also known as the adrenal gland because it secretes what? Hormone from there. Adrenaline, also known as epinephrine. So that's just one of them. But there's several other important hormones coming from there. So this is giving you a little bit extra detail about what's going on. We have a cortex, we have a medulla. Which one's the outermost region of an organ? Cortex, good. Just the way to remember it, if you didn't know it, is if you just take that your hand, you make the letter C, it's like the outer region here, and the medulla would be the inside part. So the cortex actually has three regions to it now. So here's the first time you're seeing the cortex getting divided into different regions. This one we're going to draw out as well, too. So the cortex has three regions. The first one, maybe I want to laugh a little bit, so I'm going to give you guys a chance to say the first one here. Zona what? Uh, you guys got it. Glomerulosa. Number two would be zona. There we go. Fasciculata. It's sick. It's sick, you lot. Go ahead, anyone try it again. It's sick, you lot. You know, it's sick, you lot. It's really sick, S I C K. It's sick, you lot. And then zona one, this might be you. <coughs> Eticularis. But if you take the letters G, F, and R, it sounds similar to something else. We're talking about kidneys. 
We're talking about glomerular. Again, glomerular filtration. So if you weren't using this with a packet, it would just remember from the outside in, which we're going to draw here in a moment, it goes G, F, R. So that's what everybody tends to use after they learn A and B a little bit more. Okay, so I'm going to come back to that so you can highlight it, but I want to draw it out first. So this is what I tried to jump to earlier here. Level one, where are we? Where do we start our hormones up at? Hypothalamus. I'm not going to write hypothalamus. You can if you want. But what's the hormone that's going to be coming out of the hypothalamus? Well, I'll give you the C. You tell me what the RH are. Releasing hormones. So I wrote that up for you earlier. I don't know if you guys got it. Cortico, what? Good. Cortico, tropin releasing hormone. So again, all the releasing hormones are coming from the hypothalamus. And we're going to go down to the second level here. Hopefully you guys can start to fill this in. What hormone is going to come out of this? It's going to A, C, T, H. I don't know if you guys said it quick. Probably didn't catch it. But how does it get? How does CRH get down to the pituitary? Yeah, think about what division we're going to. To the blood. That means we're going to what division? Yeah. Anterior pituitary. What's another name for the anterior pit? Adeno. Adeno. What? Hypothesis. So the adeno hypothesis. We're going to A C T. H to be released from there. That is going to go to our target organ. And our target organ is now the what? Is the adrenal gland. Also known as suprarenal gland. And it's going to get its hormones to come out of there. So there's a bunch of them. I'll just write some of them here. Uh, well, actually, no, no, we'll get into them. So there's like aldosterone and all that. Let me now go to, I'm just going to flip this over, so I'll draw the kidney, and it's going to be on top of the kidney, it's like a triangle pyramid shaped structure, I was told this is one of the, my best drawings so far, right, so the inner region, what do we call the inner region, medulla. the medulla, so from the medulla, this is right in your packet, I'm just trying to organize it a little bit, from the medulla, we get the main hormones that the gland is named after, which is going to be what? What's the name of the gland? Yep, so we're going to get what hormones? Adrenaline. And again, another name for adrenaline? Epinephrine. What's another one that's similar to it? Good. It's different, but similar. Noradrenaline, also known as... Nor epinephrine. I'm giving you these names because they're used all the time. So that's coming from the medulla. It's not coming from the cortex. ACTH is going to the cortex or to the medulla? ACTH. Where's, oops. Yeah. ACTH is going to the cortex. This stands for, oh boy, adrenocorticotropin, corticotropic. All right, let me just make sure I'm spelling this one right here. Uh, adreno, I don't know, you guys, I'll mess up probably one letter. All right, adreno, cortico, cortico, cortico referring to what? Cortex, cortico, and the T. Tropic hormone. Okay. That's ACT. So it's going to come and it's going to go to the cortex. We said the cortex has how many different divisions to it? Three. Three. So I'm just dividing it. Right. It would continue all the way around. I'm just going to work on this side right here. So we have zona, what? That's the outermost one. I gotcha. Glomerulosa. 
Then going in a little bit more, the zona. Come on. The F one. Okay, that's good. Let's not say any bad words here. Right? Fasciculata, and then inside is zona. This is easy. Yeah, reticularis. You're just probably thinking, I don't care. I have my notes, so read it from there, right? So G F R going in. So let's just go over to this side, and I'll tell you, give you guys a fun way to remember this here in a moment. So G F R. There's going to be different hormones coming out of each of them. Again, this is in your packet, but I'm just trying to break it down a little bit. The zona glomerulosa is going to release aldosterone. Aldosterone is going to go right downstairs to the kidney, and it helps with reabsorption of what? Indirectly water, but what's that? Yeah, salt, sodium, Na+. What happens when you reabsorb salt? If you remember osmosis. Water is going to fall to the area of higher or lower salt concentration. Higher, right? Water wants to help dilute the salt out. So if you reabsorb salt back into your blood, water is going to passively follow, thereby doing what to your blood pressure? Increasing it. Because right? you reabsorb salt, water follows into your blood vessel. You have more water in a pipe, so you're going to have more pressure inside of it. So aldosterone acts to increase blood pressure. And then, so we'll say this is dealing with a salt. This is called a mineral, I should have left more room here. But this is called a mineral corticoid. Corticoid referring to what? Cortex, mineral, talking about what? The salt. From the fasciculata, we're going to get cortisol, which will be converted to cortisol later. But cortisol. Cortisol is a, again, uh, sorry I didn't leave more space here, is a glucocorticoid. Again, corticoid referring to the cortex, that's where it's coming from. Gluco, talking about what? Glucose, which is the sugar. Can't wait to tell you guys this uh, learning mnemonic here. And then this right here, reticularis, is going to have androgens. Androgens are going to be your sex hormones. What are those? Testosterone and estrogen. So they're going to be coming from there, not just from there. The testes release testosterone. The ovaries are going to release estrogen. Those are your main areas. But then the adrenal gland also will be releasing some from the zona, what's our? Reticularis. So as you're going, here's a mnemonic. As you're going deeper into the adrenal gland, so you're, you're regulating salt hormones, you're regulating sugar, you're regulating sex hormones, and the mark that everybody tends to use is the deeper you go, does anybody know the rest of that? The sweeter it gets. Okay? That's, the, that's one of the best mnemonics ever. So, um, no, I'm not perverted. But there, there, is, there, is, uh, there was somebody once, it's funny, I just got to share this part. It was, they asked me why sugar not all the way down at the bottom. I was like, you're going to have a tough life. That was no more response. But anyways, so that, that's what it's going to be regulating. So if I go back to the PowerPoint packets here, now these will hopefully be easier for you guys to remember. Zona glomerulosa, mineral corticoids. Mineral, what's the mineral? Salt. And that's going to be reabsorbed back there. And that's going to be aldosterone. The fasciculata, the next one, what is that going to be regulating? After salt, we have? Sugar, so it's going to be a what corticoid? That's going to be a glucocorticoid. And then what do we call the sex hormones at the reticularis? We call them androgens. Now, just a few extra things to say about this right here is that okay, uh, what is it, sodium. When you reabsorb sodium back into your blood, you excrete potassium. And just they're going to go in opposite directions. So you're going to end up with hyper or hypokalemia if you're getting rid of a lot of potassium. 
You know, I'm not going to test you guys at this point. This is more kidney stuff. So, you know, I'm going to skip it. I'm going to go on to the next one. You would end up with hypokalemia, is the answer. But basically, what I was just saying, if you're interested, is when you reabsorb uh, sodium, you excrete potassium. So, you're going to end up with over secretion of aldosterone. You end up with hypokalemia, which is going to mess up your heart rhythms and all that stuff. But, anyways, that was kidney stuff, so I'm going to leave that out. Uh, fasciculata, glucocorticoids, so it's going to be cortisol, later it gets converted to cortisone. That's going to have to do with regulating, uh, again, what in your blood? Not salt, but sugar. This is usually released during times of stress. So on May, for you guys, 15th, we'll be releasing a lot of it. So it's going to help to give you energy, give you sugar. So what happens, though, unfortunately, with this type of release of sugar is that when it goes back to be stored, it's stored in the cells around your abdomen and then in your back, which gives the back fat there and the belly fat. So what they always say is when you're stressed, you need to work out because otherwise that sugar source is going to leave where it was, like the rest of the body, and it's all going to get concentrated around the abdomen and uh, in the back, given that hunchback appearance. Another thing as well is it's anti-inflammatory. That's why sometimes when people have, what is it, in their joints? Arthritis, which unfortunately I'm already getting. But when you get the arthritis, they take cortisol injections because anti-inflammatory fights uh, those cells there. And it talks to you a little bit more about the immune system and things. But I just want you to know it has two functions. It's going to increase the sugar levels or regulate the sugar levels during times of stress. And it also has an anti-inflammatory effect. The reticularis is going to be your androgen, so testosterone. And estrogen is just an extra region where that's going to be coming from besides the testes and the ovaries. And uh, it's stimulating by ACTH, A, by my adrenal gland, the C, talking about what region of it, the cortex, so cortical, what's the T? Tropin, and H. Every time you see an H, you know what group? It's a peptide hormone. Yeah, there's one more thing, or two more things here to do. The medulla, I already wrote this for you. Epinephrine and norepi. Epi being the, ma the major one that's coming out of there. This is why epinephrine and norepinephrine is considered a hormone. <coughs> it's considered a hormone when it comes out of the adrenal gland. It's considered a neurotransmitter when it's secreted through the neurons. So this is why it gets thrown into the class of hormones as well. And let me go back to the paper here. So there's one last point to get across. Try to draw it out right in this region right here. So we have the hypothalamus up top. And then what gland is it going to go to right beneath it? Pituitary, and we have what and what divisions of the pituitary? Anterior and posterior. So my name for the anterior. I love doing this. Adeno. Adeno. Adeno hypothesis. What's another name for the posterior? It should be easier. Yeah, you guys got that one. Neurohypothesis. Which one has the majority of the hormones? Anterior pituitary. Write that acronym F L A T P little I G. Just give me the letters, the rest of the letters. The F is going to be what? F. The L. The next one. A C T H or A D H? Good. All right. Uh, what's that word? Be confident in yourself. That's what I'm trying to say. T. T S H. The P and the I. Prolactin and the G, GH, the growth hormone. And then what are the two that are coming out of the posterior? Oxytocin and ADH. So the point I want to get across to you guys is where are these produced and where are these stored and secreted from? The anterior pituitary, it produces, stores, and secretes all these hormones. The posterior pituitary 
only stores and secretes these hormones. So what do you think is being produced? One box up there, the hypothalamus. So these are produced up here, oxytocin and ADH. How do they get down to the posterior pituitary? Yeah, the nerves. That's our neuroendocrine reflux. Going down from the nerves to the endocrine portion. So let me ask you this and I'll let you guys go here. We'll do some true false questions. True or false, ACTH is produced in the anterior pituitary gland. True. True or false, ADH is stored in the posterior pituitary gland. True. True or false, ADH is produced in the posterior pituitary gland. False. Where is it produced? Hypothalamus. What else is produced with it up there? Oxytocin. How does it make it to the posterior? Their nerves. All right, you guys can go. Bye.